Yeah, Julie, okay. yes. Okay. Sunny. Do you only take care of that? No, 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 no. No, it's Are you sure? in a locked area. Yeah. She's not here. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, well, she, that's, that's what I'm seeing. She's on planning right yeah. now. So there's yeah. no children. That's good. The kids were in and out bringing stuff in and out of there. Yeah. You she's know, got, she's been walking in that store. She's yeah. in that store. She's got that up. Yeah. Okay. So standard-based grading, individualized student approach to learning because I think for once we're going to get down to the actual student. And the challenge is in a high school setting, even in a middle school setting, when we run through 150 to 160 kids a day, and to actually individualize learning and make it differentiated for each is a big challenge. And the biggest thing for me on standard-based grading is what we know today doesn't make yesterday wrong. It only makes tomorrow better. So we keep building on our previous knowledge. And I love this. Because he's saying complexity is the enemy, and he's going to make something complicated. But to make it simple is the true challenge. So how do we narrow that focus? How do we make something very specific and still reach the end goal? So a lot of times we say keep it simple, stupid, but um, that's sometimes really hard. And that's what I've tried to work on over the course of the year. Last year, the students were and the parents um, were gracious in that I told them at the very beginning, uh, constantly I'm going to get feedback from the students. What do you think about this? How would we change that? Um, they were a great audience last year, so I think kind of did it where it is starting this year. So I love this example. Um, if you have three kids packing your parachute, okay? so at the end of the day, either you're going to live or die on this one, right? Look at this. You have student one, student two, and student three. Student one, the dotted line for each one of these is the mark to meet. Okay? And if I need to go back on these and then come back so you can see it. I love this example. So, student one starts off well, falls, student two's all over the board, and student three has some progress. So, if you're a teacher, scoring these kids, and 80% is the bar to meet. And in my class, 80% is the bar to meet. And some people might feel like that's harsh, um, but I don't. Because if you're in that 60, 70%, you kind of got it, you're on the road, but I need you to be on the road for sure. I need you to get there. Okay? So, for student one, two, and three, who would be passing? Okay? So student one, started really well, but then fell off. But if you average student one's grades, student one will pass. Student two, very difficult to predict. A lot of our trouble kids, up and down, up and down. Student three, started below, which many of our kids do. Our job and our focus, and it is students. I feel like our new teachers this year and last year know that we have a benchmark to meet on assessments, but our main goal is to meet kids where they are and take them where they need to go, and I think that's huge. So, student three was below, but proceeded.
Ashland in 22. So. Where at? Wow. Well, I started out with Ashland, Paris, uh, Hopkins yeah. County for almost 11 years. And I went on this. Very good. I grew up in Benton, Kentucky, down there, even further west. Yeah, we Hopkins. know where Benton is. Marshall yes. County. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, Great well, we've got a fantastic principal up here at your uh, elementary school. What's that guy? Which name? one? They're all great. What's it? Uh, oh, this one. Uh, oh, okay. oh, Kim Wilhoy. Kim Wilhoy. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had her in class. She's just, oh, she's, 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 We're lucky. Yes. We're lucky. Plenty of people learn. Blessed about. people. Plenty of people You guys learn. are all on YouTube. Yes, we have you on film. <laughs> so we know you visit classes. Hey guys. Hey guys. Thanks for your hard work and dedication to the kids. They are awesome. We are blessed. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes, we do. Yes, we do. He listens. Because because I did I didn't know who it was. You know. Our superintendent is in our building a lot. That's good. He doesn't That's even teachers. raise our own. That's good. That's good. Yes. Yes. Okay. So keep this in mind as we go through.
actually know where your students are. And I will be the first one to admit this is my 15th year. And last year was the very first year that I could tell you where every single student was. And it was such a good feeling to know. I knew it, and those students knew it. So it, it was, and, and I feel like I have worked very hard every year. And I felt like I knew pretty well, but could I say 100%? playing field for all students. Students identify over the course when it's intentional by the teacher what their learning style is. And if the teacher is intentional about it, they will bring that out of those students so they can move on to other classes and know and realize how they learn best. They will try again. That's my favorite thing. And that's what we always encourage students to do is try, try again. But that when we give them a unit test on the traditional grading scale, they fail it, I'm sorry, you can try again on the next unit test when we still don't know the information from the first one. That's right. So the grading practices, can we control them? Um, I will tell you that throughout the year last year, Mr. Leaper was very lenient. Um, I won't say lenient, I just, he just went out on the limb and just trusted me, to be honest, and I so value that because um, I looked at different schools that were getting standard-based rating right, that assessing scores were moving up. I called, I emailed, I went and visited those schools, I picked those teachers' brains, I got what they were doing correctly, and how I could move it into mine, and again, I went on to the next school. So, that was pretty bad. We got that assessment right. Once again, great to have meaning. I love this, because, you know, this child failed the test, and it's going to be competitive. And we would love to go back to the old curve. The students are very used to heightened on curve. Well, most of us, everybody failed, Ms. Broughton, or everybody, you know, got that 60. So are we going to have that curve? And most teachers kind of fail to that um, pressure of, mm, I can't have that many failures on my test. What is administration going to think? What are parents going to think? Maybe it's not fault. Maybe it's not. So they begin to question themselves. Drawbacks. Um, I think. It is very scary um, for a lot of teachers, students, and parents because it's change. And anytime you change something that is this drastic, if you give a numerical value to somebody and how it's determined, that's very scary to them. And it's also um, a challenge for teachers to figure out this is the system and how is it going to best fit for my classroom. And I will say, I feel like this school compared to our sister school, they kind of jumped into it right away. And we've kind of let it um, soak in. And what I have found last year and already through the summer and this year is teachers have come to me and said, what are you doing? What is this? What does that look like? This is what I've heard. How do I do it? So it's been nice in that teachers are adapting it to their classroom as opposed to one size fits all. So my main essential question Standard-based grading in an effective way. You know, does it work? Second one, what's the most effective way to implement and to have ownership in the classroom? So does it work? How do we do it? And then how do we collect the data? And keep it simple, all wrapped up into one. So the process for me. The units of study, as you remember, are scientific process, cells, and ecology. The way that they were scored, mastery was 8 out of 10, so that's 80%, partial and non-mastery. 
also had another mentor, uh, Ms. Simpson. She is she was our instructional coach last year. She's an assessment coordinator this year. So she also worked with me along with Ms. Stafford to kind of put this together. So progress was measured. Remediation determined by mastering the standards. I knew that if the kids did not meet that 80%, I knew that was going to be a huge target for these kids because this is special ed collaboration class. Most of these kids, when I told them that, they wanted to run out of the classroom. A couple walked out of the classroom, threw their hands up, said choice words, and said, I'm out of here. And of course, we went and got them and threw them back in here. And they, they said, I've never passed a test in my life. What makes you think I'm going to start now? Because they did it on the homework and they did it on the projects. And I said, oh, magic happens in your bed. So I knew at that point that I needed to come up with a system that would work for remediation. You don't meet this benchmark, how are we going to get to where you want to go? At the same time, I have this amount of standards that I have to get through with 8% mastery with the rest of the class. So I came up with um, a worksheet correlated set. And if you look over there on that wall, um, it looks similar to that. So the students will find out what standard they missed. And where it says tighten up your standards. Um, it's labeled, and then they go pull from those folders. It's a worksheet set for them to do that. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you um, what the video correlation looked like. Because I thought, you know, if I'm a student and I have failed this assignment and this problem has continued to move on at a pace, then how am I going to recover that work? And not every student works from a worksheet packet. Sometimes they're almost negative. For me, I'm, I'm a visual learner. I show video clips and do labs all the time. So I developed a video set. So there's two choices, two links from my webpage that they were able to choose from. And then there's a question set that correlates. So the same questions correlate for either video that they choose to watch. They watch it, they answer the questions, they come in for a conference with me and say, I'm just fine, I'm ready. And we clear the need thing that they may not understand. So that um, was implemented January of last year, and the kids really bought into it because they can be on the phone, they can, they're always on the internet, as they are, and they appreciated that. So that seemed to work. I didn't see any differences in the video set or the worksheet set, probably more buy-in quicker because they knew that they could get it faster. Yeah. And the video sets were 10 to 15 minutes. That's all we needed for those individual standards. This um, is kind of where we started last year. I wanted um, every classroom that I visited that had standard-based grading, there was no visual for the students. There was no, there wasn't anything when they came in that was always an awareness. And for me, I have to see it. I, I want to see it. Every day when I walk in, I want to know where every one of those kids are. And I wanted the kids, you know, the whole key was that individualized learning. It was that ownership for these kids. And so, they take their standards, it's a live score. So they instantly color green or they color red. And they do it. And so this year, these boards were just put up. But um, the board that you see in the back and this large board here, those are going to correlate and look like this. And so when the students take their standard test, it's like an assembly line. They come through. Um, each standard test is seven to ten questions, so I know what those multiple choice answers are. And either they meet the mark of 80% or they receive a zero. And it was tough at the beginning. It was really hard. And um, I had to build that culture in class. And I said, you know, hate me now and love me tomorrow because you are not going to fail anymore. And so as soon as they would take a standard, then they would instantly go over there because they have a number that's ambiguous. And so they would instantly color green or they would color red. And then when they came in, they made that standard up. Then the green, I mean the red changed to green. And for the kids, the biggest thing was, you think I can take that test again? Yes. Can I take it two times? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So for them, they couldn't believe that that was even going to be an option. And for me, I just need you to know the information. I just need you to understand that. So with this system, and of course they were all through the room, but the kids can instantly see.
see it, it um, post competition for each class, which was pretty cool. And I knew it was not a little data sheet in their notebook, which that you know for some teachers that works for them. But to me, it was right there every day when you walk in. I can look back as I'm teaching these kids, and I know where they are and where they need to be. And as I'm teaching a lesson, I can always kind of circle back and I can glance back and say, "Hey, you didn't understand this little piece. Let's incorporate it right now." So it was pretty helpful. So student ownership, once again, try, try again. But I just went through. Um, in the assessment for these, most are multiple choice because that's what the EOC is going to be for them. But that is not limited to models that they might build. It might be an oral presentation. It could be a written presentation. Um, I try to find out what the kids feel comfortable and are good at and can adapt. This is the standard. Now, what do you want to do with that? And especially for our lower level kids, they've never, for the most part, had a choice. They've always been mandated of what they're going to do. And so that's really been huge. And I've often heard a lot of times, too, and they'll say, well, it's fine. It's always been those kids that get to do that. So it's been great. So pre-assessment, mastery is in blue, the red is partial, and then the non is in orange. And for the pre-assessments, um, pretty normal. That um, you would have not a lot of mastery on these. The EOC questions are what I give the kids for pre and post assessment. I want those kids to be able to see those questions as often as possible and how they're worded so they're very comfortable with that going into the test. This reviews pre assessment is roughly about the same. There's not a lot to think of there. Um, a lot of partial mastery. Um, when I went to a lot of schools, and actually it was Dr. Barber, he was, I was sitting in a conference on sex accreditation when I was
if they were demonstrating this skill in another classroom, I'm completely fine, I'm pretty sure, with them showing that skill to me in this classroom. English teachers um, have had a hard time buying into that, what's that going to look like? And I actually went to an English teacher at another school, and even though I'm science, I wanted to know, it was, it was effective, what are you doing? And so this was one of the pieces that um, she brought in, and she said the kids really bought into this. So I thought that was pretty cool, because we, you know, we, we want to um, plan across the content areas, but then do we then feed that back into the kids? And I think this would be a great way um, to do that. And speaking of the writing piece, um, this year for our data teams to track this, um, instead of doing individual standards and individual content areas, I'm going to ask 